gravity, which is our theory of gravity. And, you know, most of the phenomena we see is explained by some combination of these two aspects of physics. Um, however, in cosmology, we want to apply the principles of physics, as we know it, to understanding the evolution of the universe as a whole. So the whole universe is our system, and we want to understand its evolution. And when we try to apply what we knew of physics from terrestrial experiments, uh, it turned out that we were missing something. Okay. So there were multiple hints of this. So when, for example, Vera Rubin and collaborators looked at rotation curves of galaxies, they found missing mass. This came to be known as dark matter. Um, then a few decades later, when people looked at uh, how the universe is expanding, they found that contrary to our ex uh, expectations that the expansion rate should be slowing down, uh, it turned out that the ex expansion rate is actually accelerating. Okay? So the, uh, the, the component of the universe, the mysterious component of the universe that drives that accelerated expansion, we call it dark energy. So immediately within a few decades, we realized that our understanding of physics is incomplete. We don't yet know incomplete in what way. So we want to probe this further. Uh, over the years, people then have come up with what is known as the standard model of cosmology. So apart from the physics that we know, uh, it has two additional and phenomenological ingredients, dark matter and dark energy. Dark energy actually makes up most of the energy budget of our universe. So 73% of the energy density of the universe is dark energy. The properties of dark energy they are quite counterintuitive. Um, it has properties which would make it something like negative pressure. We don't know of anything else that has negative pressure. 23% uh, of the universe is dark matter. So the matter that gravitates like normal matter, but we don't know what makes up this 23%. Then of course, there are, there's matter that we know. So there's hydrogen, helium, electrons, uh, neutrinos, and so on. So you see that, you know, almost 96% of the universe is made up of stuff that is not included here. Okay. And so cosmology allows us to probe this. And the current paradigm in cosmology called the Lambda CDM universe makes certain simplifying assumptions about this picture. It assumes that dark energy is the cosmological constant. Um, so uh, as as the universe expands, the energy density does not go down. So that's the cosmological constant. And dark matter is cold and collisionless. So whatever, uh, whatever, make, what, whatever are the microscopic constituents of dark matter, today they don't really interact with each other or with the standard model, except through gravity. These are the assumptions of the lambda CDM paradigm. Again, this is, these are assumptions, and we want to test these or break these at some point. Okay, now it's useful to think about what we know about cosmology in terms of what's happening to the background universe and what's happening to perturbations on this background universe. So the expansion rate of the background universe um, are things that are probed by looking at, for example, uh, how distant galaxies are moving away from each other. So Hubble in 1920, discovered the expansion of the universe by looking at distant galaxies and measuring how fast they are moving away from us. Uh, then the supernova measurements of the 2000s, uh, that's the plot I have up here, showed us that the universe as a whole is uh, expanding at an accelerated rate. Okay, So that's the background universe. So the background universe expands. You can measure the rate of its expansion, whether it's slowing up, slowing down, or uh, uh, getting faster. But the second thing to think about are the perturbations on this background. Okay, So maybe some of you have seen pictures of the cosmic microwave background. So if you look at the cosmic microwave background, you'll see actually this is the mean subtracted version. If you, if you keep the mean in, then you'll never see these fluctuations because these fluctuations are one part in 10 to the power 5. 
So the universe started off with small fluctuations and gravity, what it does is if you had a fluctuation where there's more matter than its surroundings, gravity will drive even more matter into that point. If a region of the universe started off with less density than the surroundings, then it will continue to get emptier and emptier. So gravity drives these small perturbations to grow and become these large perturbations over time. So what are these large perturbations? So when you look up at the night sky, you'll see galaxies, which are regions of extremely high density, okay? So the densities are of the order of 10 to the four times the mean density. And then you'll see regions where there's absolutely no matter. So gravity drives this entire process. So this is a snapshot of the universe when it was young. This is a snapshot of the universe today. And gravity is responsible for most of this happening. Okay. Now, if you've taken GR, you'll know that gravity is actually sourced by what's there in the universe. So what components of the universe, how they behave, their relative abundances, uh, all of these quantities actually determine the map from here to here. So if we can understand what's happening between our universe being very young and our universe today, we can actually learn a lot about the different energy components in the universe. So going back, if we understand structure, this is the process that I'm calling structure formation. If we understand structure formation in detail, we can then go back and say more about dark energy, dark matter, and other fundamental questions that you can think of. Okay. Um, before going further, it's useful to remind ourselves of a few relevant length scales. So this is a picture from the SDSS collaboration. This is a cosmological survey um, which started maybe about 20 years back and it's still continuing in some sense. Uh, every dot that you see on this uh, uh, picture is actually a galaxy whose spectra has been measured. Uh, this distance, so we are the observer sitting somewhere here, is about one gigaparsec. Okay. Um, I believe gigaparsec is about 10 to the 12? Nine. nine. Okay. Parsecs. 10 to the 9 parsecs. Okay. I, <laughs> thank you. On these scales, you'll notice that the universe or the distributions of galaxies, which we are taking to be a proxy of what's happening in the universe, are largely homogeneous and isotropic. So if I drew a pretty large uh, not a sphere, but a circle on this picture, if I drew large circles in this picture, I would find roughly the same number of galaxies in each of those circles, okay? So on very large scales, the universe is homogeneous or very close to being homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, different regions of the universe will have small fluctuations around the mean. So your circles will not have exactly the same number of galaxies, but they'll be roughly the same, small deviations from the mean. Um, the important thing is that even today, this is redshift zero. So whenever cosmologists write Z, it means redshift. Even at redshift zero at the current time, the universe is still uh, close to being homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. Um, and because it's close to being homogeneous and isotropic on large scales, there's a parameter called the overdensity parameter, which is basically the value of the density at a given point minus the mean density divided by the mean density, which is guaranteed to be small. Now, if the density contrast delta is small, that gives you uh, an expansion parameter. And so physicists are very happy. We can do linear perturbation theory. You can basically write down the equations that govern the evolution of these small fluctuations and determine what happens with time. Okay. Uh, the equations actually turn out to be really simple. It's just these equations here. Um, now you can do this and determine how the small structures that you saw in the CMB should look like today. But this formalism will break down at some point because gravity will drive delta to become larger and larger up to a point where you can no longer do linear perturbation theory with it. You can do higher order perturbation theory. In fact, uh, there's some there's a framework called the effective field theory of large scale structure, which people are working on today, which tries to extend this uh, framework down to smaller scales. But once you get down to say like 
40 megaparsecs or so. Um, I skipped this, but uh, just to remind you that, uh, actually I missed this. So when I say megaparsecs, what's the size of our galaxy? Does anyone remember? I heard a megaparsec. No, it's a kilo, 20-ish kiloparsec. Okay, so when you, when you get to maybe a thousand times that scale, the, uh, so the galaxy is highly nonlinear, right? You know, compared to the voids, this is very, very dense. <clears throat> so perturbation theory actually breaks down at roughly thousand times that scale. So maybe 25 to 40 megaparsec. Um, so at these scales, you can no longer do perturbation theory. So what do you do next? Okay. Now, given that the large scales are more easily described and analyzed, most cosmology analysis have focused on the large scale. So you looked at the map from SDSS. People have extracted all the information that they can from the large scales. I'll actually come back to what information extraction means at a later point in this talk. But most of the cosmology analysis have focused on these large scales. And we are close, but not quite, to exhausting what we can learn about the universe from these large scales. So whatever the universe or structure formation can tell us about dark energy or dark matter from these large scales, from the analysis of large scales, we are close to finishing. But you will see that there are many cosmology experiments planned for the next 20 years. Okay? Um, they cover a whole range of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. So there are uh, optical uh, surveys, there are radio surveys uh, all over the place, okay? So what are these people going to do? We have almost finished the information on large scales, yet there are so many surveys planned. What will they do? What we'll do is we'll be forced to look at smaller scales, okay? Um, why should we look about at smaller scales? So there are multiple lines of argument. One is that if you look at smaller scales, you get many independent regions within the observable, observable universe. What does this mean? So suppose you were looking at a region of one gigaparsec cube volume, and you ask the question, what are, you know, how do the number densities of galaxies fluctuate in 100 megaparsec cubed regions? you would be only able to fit a few of these into the one gigaparsec cube volume. So your statistical error is going to be pretty large. But if you, if you ask the question, what happens to one megaparsec cube regions, you will find many thousands of these in that same region. So your statistical error goes down. So this is one argument for why you should uh, uh, consider smaller scales. Um, the same thing, if you actually put it into uh, uh, numbers, the total information naively scales as k max q. k max is the wave number. So think of this as one over the length q. So if you can go down by a factor of two in length, you get eight times more information, nine. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of information on small scales. So that's more of a theoretical uh, sort of uh, driver. But it also so happens that these scales are already measured in surveys. So when the surveys actually go out and map out the night sky, they already have information about these small scales. Okay. So the theory and the modeling part actually needs to catch up with the data that's already there. In fact, it turns out that the highest signal to noise ratio is actually around one megaparsec for most surveys. So all the existing cosmology analysis has been throwing out a lot of information. Okay. So this is why we want to go down to smaller scales. Um, what is the challenge? The challenge is that the density contrast is now much greater than one. So perturbation techniques will not work. So we need something new. What is this new thing? It's numerical techniques such as n-body simulations. These are typically much, much more expensive than perturbation theory calculations. So that's the challenge. How, how do we cast the problem of structure formation into something that the computer can solve for us in manageable time? Okay. And what's the promise? What are the outstanding science questions that we can answer if we can actually do uh, come up with this program? 
we can answer questions like what drove inflation was there one single field that drove inflation at the beginning of the universe uh, how did it end so these are questions about reheating how the i'm going to use some technical terms so bear with me how the infliton then transferred its energy to what we see around us is dark energy consistent with being a cosmological constant so dark energy, if it were the cosmological constant, its equation of state would be minus one. So equation of state is uh, pressure over density, roughly. For the cosmological constant, that is exactly minus one. If it is some other component, then we can test whether W is actually minus one or something close, something slightly off. We can test the effects of various dark matter models on structure formation. I said that one of the pillars of the lambda CDM paradigm is that dark matter is cold and collisionless. We can actually test it if we look at nonlinear structure formation. Uh, another very exciting thing is that we can pin down the total mass of the standard model neutrinos from cosmology. This is going to be one of the most promising deliverables that cosmology will have in the next 10 years is making this measurement. Um, so a lot of you might know about the neutrinos. So there are three neutrinos in the standard model. We now know they're massive. We know their mass squared differences, but we don't know what their total mass is. Okay, So that's unknown from terrestrial experiments. Already, uh, cosmology tells us that the sum of the masses cannot be more than 0.12 electron volts, very, very light. At the same time, particle physics experiments can put this bound at only about 1 EV. So a factor of 10 higher. So cosmology is the most promising way of getting the neutrino mass in the next 10 years. Of course, you can you know, tie it up on the other side are questions about galaxy formation, dynamics of substructures, and so on. Um, I've been focusing on more of fundamental physics questions that cosmology can help answer. There are also a lot of astrophysical questions that cosmology <clears throat> is intimately tied to, and if we solve uh, how to model the small scales, we'll have to think of both aspects. Okay? I'll not get into this in too much detail. Right. So coming to these numerical simulations, what do they simulate? So they actually try to simulate uh, the phase space density of dark matter. So as I told you, dark matter is the dominant clustering component in the universe. So if we can understand its phase space evolution, that give, gives us a very good handle of understanding cosmological structure formation. So if you can, you can write down the equation that governs the, the evolution of the phase space of dark matter. So F is the phase space distribution. Uh, this equation looks like the Boltzmann equation in expanding space time. It's technically called the Vlasov Poisson set of equation because the Poisson equation sits here, completes the loop. Uh, if you think about it, this equation is actually quite hard to solve. Uh, the phase space distribution is a six dimensional entity. And if you include time, it's seven dimensional. Uh, so if you try to solve this on a grid or something, it, which is six dimensional, that problem is almost intractable, even though there are groups who have tried to do this directly. However, what you can do is using something called the method of characteristics. Some of you might have studied this in mathematical physics. This partial differential equation can be converted into a set of ordinary differential equations. If you stare at these ordinary differential equations, you'll notice that they look suspiciously like the motion of individual particles, okay? Newtonian equations of motions for particles, okay? Even though what you've done is discretize the phase space of dark matter. Um, so the equations of motion of, you know, you can transform the original Vlasov Poisson equation into the equations of motion of particles moving under the influence of the gravitational potential phi. <clears throat> so all of the dynamics is set by this gravitational potential phi, which in turn is set by the distribution of all the particles that you have. This is why this is called <clears throat> n-body simulations, because you discretize phase space into n simulation particles. These are not real particles. And then you're following the motions of these particles under their collective gravity. There's no other external force on this system. It's always useful to remember that these are not real particles. These are patches of phase space. Um, 
And the other good thing about this way of uh, recasting your equation is this is this is inherently Lagrangian in nature. So wherever there is more mass, there will be more particles. So you will have more resolution. Okay, so that's what Lagrangian means in this context. Okay, so then let me show you what an n-body simulation actually looks like. Um, so you'll see here a volume in which particles have been placed. Initially, the distribution of particles look very uniform, but as time evolves or as redshift goes down, these sort of turn into a very characteristic pattern. This is known as the cosmic web. Um, so what these simulations actually do is they generate the initial conditions when perturbation theory is still valid. So at very early times, that's why the distribution was more or less uniform. And then it evolves under its own gravity. If you have computational resources, you increase the number of particles in the same volume. So the number density, if you can increase, you get higher resolution. So nowadays, typically people would use a billion particles to run this simulation. But if you think about it, this computation scales as n squared. Because every, for every particle, I need to know the force from every other particle. Okay? Then I have to move on to the next particle and again compute the forces from every other particle. So if I have n particles, this actually nicely scales as n squared. But over the last 40 years, people have developed techniques to allow for a much shallower scaling. So scales as n log n. There are multiple ways to do this. You can compute the forces in Fourier space. You can use tree structures. If anyone wants to know the details, I'm happy to talk about this uh, later. But just know that there are many methods now which allow you to have a much shallower scaling. This is actually what allows you to do these billion particle simulations. If you had a billion particles and then you needed 1 billion times 1 billion steps, you would never be able to do it. But now let's look at the features that show up in this simulation. Okay, So you'll see these patterns where there are lots of particles which end up there. Okay, So these are the dark matter halos. This is where galaxies will form finally. Okay? So these places will light up. Connecting the halos, you'll see these long stretchy structures. These are called filaments. Okay, So small galaxies will form in these filaments and then travel towards the larger you know, sort of halos with force structure. And the third thing you'll notice is that there are regions which completely evaporate. So there, there are no particles left in those regions. These are called voids. Okay? There's nothing happening in those voids. Those are completely dark. Uh, this whole thing, this whole structure is typically called the cosmic web. Okay. Uh, for lambda CDM cosmology, the n-body method has been tested extensively and we now can trust these results. Um, you can see that you know this is actually the, the snapshot of outputs from 35 different simulations actually. So we now can run multiple of these simulations, actually hundreds of them. We can change one parameter at a time. We can change, say, what the rate of the expansion of the universe is. So we can change the Hubble rate, run one simulation. We can change the amplitude of the initial power spectrum, which controls how large the CMB fluctuations were. We can run another simulation. So it is now possible for us to scan different parameters of interest within the Lambda CDM framework and see which one our universe is closer to. That's the rough uh, end goal of this uh, program. But at the same time, we are also interested in expanding the range of models that we wish to test using nonlinear structure formation. So we have the data. We can now change our model, run the simulations, and try to compare which one is closer to the data. In this way, rule out different interesting models. Okay. And to test these different models, which I'll briefly describe in the next few slides, I'll not go into details. We need to update some of the techniques that were used for Lambda CDM cosmology, and in some cases, find completely new ones. Okay? So what are some of these extensions that we are interested in? One that I've already told you about are massive neutrino cosmologies. So neutrinos, unlike cold dark matter, have thermal velocities. 
So if you naively try to put them into simulations using the techniques that were developed already, they would just zoom about in your simulations and create noise. Okay? And so in the last 10 years, many people, many groups, including myself, we have discovered uh, ways of getting around you know, this effect of introducing noise from the thermal velocities. So now we are confident about using massive neutrino cosmologies as well uh, uh, sort of as an extension to standard lambda CDM cosmology. Uh, so, right. So just as an example, the earlier techniques would have given you a density field of neutrinos, which would look like this, which is purely garbage. And then with the new methods that we developed, you can see the cosmic web structure appear also in the neutrinos. Okay, so now we can reliably simulate massive neutrino cosmologies. Okay. Um, and we don't have to stop at neutrinos. The techniques that were developed to run these simulations can be used to study the effects of any additional light species. Okay. Uh, so suppose there is some dark photon, okay, which contributes to uh, uh, the energy density of the universe. Suppose there's some extra light species like a uh, sterile neutrino. Again, it will have effects on structure formation. And so by looking at the, 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 the structure forming on small scales, you can study all of these models. Um, you can try to test stress test another pillar of lambda CDM, which is whether dark matter is completely collisionless or not. Okay. You can say, you can ask the question, what happens if I allow dark matter to interact, not just gravitationally, but through some other interactions? We don't let dark matter interact directly with standard model particles because those sorts of models are well constrained by terrestrial experiments. But for dark matter, dark matter interactions, you will not get any signal in terrestrial experiments. You have to understand what's happening in the structure formation of the universe, not in some local sort of lab, lab environment. So this is what I was saying. So certain dark matter models have signatures um, that are detectable only through indirect methods. Okay, And so now the challenge is to include them this, this paradigm is called the self-interacting dark matter paradigm. How do you include additional interactions of dark matter in n-body simulations? Again, people have worked on this over the past 10 or 15 years. And now we can look at this set of models. People have also expanded what they can look at. The first few, sim first few simulations looked at only elastic collisions of dark matter. Now you can simulate inelastic collisions of dark matter and so on. Um, okay, I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, another sort of new class of models that's become interesting in the last few years is the question of what happens if dark matter is made up of particles that are extremely light. And when I say extremely light, these are sub-electron volt particles. Okay. Just to keep things in perspective, the electron mass is... 0.5 MeV. So this is many orders of magnitude lighter than that. Now, once particles are this light, um, thinking of them as individual particles is not the best way to go about it because the number density, the occupation number is so high, it is more useful to think of this in terms of, of a field. Okay, so for very light dark matter particles, what you really have to solve is no longer the Vlasov Poisson set of equations, but the Schrodinger Poisson set of equations, because the wave-like nature of this becomes important. And again, this has received much attention in the last you know, seven or eight years, uh, especially. And there's some beautiful phenomenology associated with these cosmologies. So they form solitonic cores at the centers of halos, presence of interference fringes here. So because the, the, you know, the wave-like nature of these dark matter particles are important, you get things like interference fringes and so on. So you know, everything that we had learned about lambda CDM simulation had to be thrown out of the door and people had to invent completely new techniques for this. But now that we have, we can go ahead and study this and test this against real data. Okay, again, I'll sort of skip this in the interest of time. So 
in this part of the talk, I've given you a very brief sort of glimpse at the fact that numerical simulations are essential to work out the precise predictions of theoretical models. So you can write down, say, a new particle physics Lagrangian. Say you have some fancy theory of the dark sector. You need simulations to actually translate them to things that you can compare with real data. Okay? And because these are, you know, the interesting phenomenology actually appears in the nonlinear regime, you absolutely need to depend on these simulations. Um, and acts, you know, what's also happened in the last 10, 15 years is we have gotten access to much greater computing power. So you can explore these wide range of theoretical models and try to test them against data. So simulations allow you to do that. Could I pause briefly if there are questions before I move on to the next part of the talk? Or I can. Okay, so. Ah, uh, this image is of the same object form. So the initial conditions of three different simulations, which were the same, but one which had cold dark matter, one which had warm dark matter, and one which had fuzzy dark matter. In the cold dark matter case, you see structure has formed to quite a good extent. There's a clear halo here. And also there are substructures here. In the warm dark matter cosmology, the central object is forming, but you'll see that the smaller objects have not formed at all. This is a well-known fact of warm dark matter cosmologies where you know, dark matter, when it decouples from everything else, still has some, uh, it's slightly relativistic. What that does is it, it washes out the smallest structures. The largest structures form as they would, but the smallest structures are washed out because of the thermal, let's call it thermal streaming. Okay. So this is what happens in the warm dark matter cosmology. In the fuzzy dark matter cosmology, you see that the main object is roughly similar, but you see these interference fringes. Okay, That is happening because the wave-like nature is much more important in the fuzzy dark matter uh, uh, model. What is the scheme of the scheme of the uh, I would guess that it would be something like 10 megaparsec on this side and maybe a megaparsec on this side. Uh, these fringes are typically few kiloparsec. That's a very interesting question. Uh, whether these fringes actually, so, you know, these fringes also have a time evolution, which is much faster than what's happening with the rest of the stuff. And one interesting question is, do these fringes actually have, what are the observational consequences of these fringes? Uh, because these are transient, so you know, matter does not fall into them directly, but there is a time varying potential. So maybe they kick things out or something. So how do you actually uh, uh, make use of these fringes? That's a very interesting question. That's also okay, I can continue. Okay. okay. Now, I've said multiple times during my talk that we want to compare data and theoretical predictions. Okay? So how do you do that? Um, this is the typical output of an n-body simulation, just like I was showing you earlier. So you have halos here, then your filaments, and then your voids. And this is actually a slice of the SDSS data, but looking at it from a slightly different angle. So how would you compare something like this to something like that? So here you have a map of galaxy positions. Here say, you know, let's abstract it and say you are given a list of halo positions. How do you compare the two? Your first instinct might be to compare it object by object, but that actually won't work because you don't know which patch of the universe you are looking at. You might be looking at a slightly different patch and then there's no reason why your simulation could match object by object. Instead, you have to do this comparison at a statistical level. Okay, So some statistical quantity that I can get out of positions of galaxies, of halos in our simulations, I should be able to compare to some statistical quantity that I get by get from uh, the positions of the galaxies in my data. So these things are usually called summary statistics. So they summarize your data in a certain way. And then you can compare these against one another. 
So the most widely used statistical measure in cosmology is the power spectrum or its Fourier transform, uh, the two-point correlation function, typically denoted by psi. Um, so what is the definition of the power spectrum or the two-point correlation function? You remember this quantity delta, which is the over density. <coughs> to compute the two-point correlation function xi, I take delta at one point x, I take delta at some point separated by distance r, okay? And I evaluate this product over all possible locations, okay? That gives me the two-point correlation function. If this correlation function is high, it means that if I have a fluctuation upwards at one point, then at some point r, uh, some point separated by distance r, I'm also e very likely to also have an upward fluctuation. When xi is zero, it means that two points separated by distance r act are actually fluctuating independent of each other. Um, a similar definition in A space or wave number space gives you the power spectrum. Okay, and you know as the universe uh, becomes older and the density fluctuations grow with gravity, the effect on the power spectrum is that the power spectrum grows. So the power spectrum started off like this at some high redshift. At redshift of zero, it has grown to a higher amplitude. Okay, so this power spectrum is trying to capture the growth of structure. Okay, um, so what I say right now about the power spectrum and the two-point correlation function holds for continuous fields. But I just said I want to look at galaxy positions. Okay. So how do I summarize the two-point correlation function or how do I calculate the two-point correlation function for discrete tracers? Okay. So what I do is I take my original set of halo positions. So again, I'm going back to the simulations. So on the left, the dark uh, blue dots actually reflect the positions of halos in a simulation. On the right, I have thrown an equal number of points, but completely randomly in this 2D space. Okay. Now I can try to co count up the number of pairs at a distance r on the left-hand figure and on the right-hand figure. So I choose a distance r, say 10 megaparsec. I count up all the num all the pairs on the left-hand plot that are separated by 10 megaparsec plus minus some epsilon. You can choose that epsilon. I repeat the same procedure on the right. What I get from the left-hand one, I call dd, data, data. What I get from the right, I call random, random. Because remember on the right-hand plot, I just threw those numbers of points at random. It turns out that you can show rigorously that the two-point correlation function, the unbiased estimator of that can be written by dd over rr minus one. In, to put this another way, the two-point correlation function is the excess probability of finding pairs separated by uh, distance r over completely random distributions, okay? So the higher this value is, the more correlated the points are. It turns out that the power spectrum or the two-point correlation function is a complete summary statistic of a Gaussian random field. What is a Gaussian random field? One very simple definition. Mathematicians will probably kill me if I say that this is the definition. If you, if you have a field and you smooth it on some radius r, look at the distribution of the values that you get, they form a Gaussian. Okay? For this talk, let's assume that a Gaussian random yes. field is just that. I measure the value of the field smoothed on some scale at every point in my universe. I make a histogram of those values, and that turns out to be a Gaussian. If that were the case, there's a theorem which says that the two-point correlation function or the power spectrum is the only thing that you need to measure for such a field. So the CMB is a good example of a Gaussian random field. And that's why all CMB analysis focuses on the two-point correlation function. Because it's on, on the surface of the sky, they measure CLs and not PKs, but that's a different discussion. But at late times, the field is highly non-Gaussian. Okay. So you can see that you know there are places which have very high density. There are places where there's absolutely nothing. 
the places which have absolutely nothing actually dominate the volume. So most of your volume is made up of places which have absolutely nothing. This distribution, if you plot it, I'll show you a plot, is very, very non-Gaussian. So just measuring the two-point correlation function does not tell us everything about this field. Okay. So people have thought about this for a while, going back to the 90s. Um, and they said, okay, why should we consider just the two-point correlations? We can consider three-point correlations. How are densities correlated at three different points, at four different points, and so on. And of course, they have a lot of extra information. But what happens is that computing these higher-order correlation functions become very time-consuming. Okay? They scale as n square and n cube rather than n log n. By the way, this is a cool uh, illustration of the fact that two fields can actually be visually very different, so the left hand and the right hand, and they have exactly the same power spectrum. Okay, so the red and the blue, so this is this plot is of the power spectrum, are exactly the same, even though visually these two fields are completely different. It's only when you go to the three and four point correlation functions that you see a difference between the two fields. So this is a useful uh, uh, method, but this is uh, computationally very expensive. The other way to do this is to look at the full density PDA. So just like I said, you measure the density of the universe or the number of galaxies inside a sphere and place that sphere at different parts of the universe, make a histogram of what you get. If it turns out to be Gaussian, which it does at very high redshift, then the two-point correlation function is a good measure. But at redshift zero, you see this red curve is extremely non-Gaussian. So you can say that instead of measuring the two-point correlation function, I can just measure the PDF. But that also has a few drawbacks. For example, you know, what do you measure about the PDF? It's just a histogram. The binning depends on what you chose. It becomes subjective. So there are some drawbacks to this. So in the last uh, 10 minutes, I will talk about a method that I've been working on, which tries to capture more information about the non-Gaussian field than the two-point correlation function or the PDF method or the higher order uh, correlation function. Um, so let me first describe the measurement and then I'll tell you what it actually measures. So you have some uh, region over which you want to describe the clustering of a set of points. First thing you do is you plot this volume with things called query points. I'll tell you why they're called query points. The data is distributed in a certain way. So the query points are these uh, lighter points here. I don't know if you can see them clearly. Can you see them? Okay. And then the data points are these more, uh, are these larger dots. Okay. So what we do is we go to every query point and we measure the distance to the nearest neighbor data points. So from this query point, for example, the yellow arrow points to the first nearest neighbor data point. The red arrow points to this. Maybe I've got this the other way around. Um, okay. The different arrows point to different nearest neighbor data points. Okay. I go to another query point. Again, I measure the distances to the nearest neighbor data points. So now for every query point, I have a list of distances to the first nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor. So let me just consider the list of distances to the first nearest neighbor from every query point. Now it turns out that if I sort this list, it gives me the empirical cumulative distribution function of the distances. Okay, just that one sorting, and we can discuss this in detail if you're, if it does not make sense right now, but it gives you the empirical CDM of the distances. Now, two quick takeaways. A single measurement procedure is sufficient for a range of scales. So all the numbers that appeared in the column of first nearest neighbor distances, once you measure the empirical CDM, you'll see all of them appearing in the CDM. So this is the x-axis, which is distance, and the y-axis is the cumulative distribution function. Like all cumulative distribution functions, it goes from zero on the left-hand side to one on the right-hand side. And the second thing to appreciate is that this is computationally very cheap. It's just a list of numbers. I sort that. 
And finding the nearest neighbor also scales as n log n. So this takes about 20 seconds on a single code. Now I will say that this is a very good summary statistics of non-Gaussian distributions. I'll come to why. But if you compare the time taken to compute the CDS to the higher order correlation function, something like this with the same number of data points as in the nearest neighbor distribution would take you a few hours on your laptop. So this you can do in 20 seconds. So what do these nearest neighbor cumulative distribution functions actually measure? So the measurement of the first nearest neighbor CDF, let's say, you can convince yourself is equivalent to measuring the probability of finding greater than zero particles in a volume of radius r. Okay. Now you can try to write down the generating function for this probability. I don't know if you're all familiar with generating functions, but if not, we can, uh, you can ask me later. Now, if you write down the generating function for this probability distribution, it turns out that it has a, first of all, it has a closed form expression. And secondly, that closed form expression actually depends on all, uh, on a combination of all endpoint correlations of the data. Okay. So by this one single measurement, you are sensitive to all endpoint correlations of data, not just the two point correlation. And even better, if you measure not just the first nearest neighbor distribution, but the second nearest neighbor distribution, you're actually sensitive to a different combination of all endpoint correlations. So by measuring sufficient numbers of these, you can actually get information about the individual endpoint correlation functions in the data. Okay. Um, you can also relate this to the PDF formalism that I spoke about briefly, but I'll not get into that. <clears throat> These, there are some really nice mathematical connections between them. So what's the outcome? The outcome is that for cosmology, the higher order endpoint correlation functions also carry information, just like the two point correlation function or the power spectrum was used in previous analysis to determine the cosmology the higher order endpoint correlation functions also depend uniquely on cosmology. So if you can measure the higher order correlation functions at the same time, you get a better handle on the cosmological parameters. So for example, equation of state of dark energy, neutrino mass, and so on. Okay. I'll give you a brief physical intuition of what's happening with the nearest neighbor distribution. So again, on the left, I have a plot where actual halo positions from a simulation are plotted. On the right, there are equal number of points, but thrown randomly. Now, if I measure the nearest neighbor from all query points, remember the query points are distributed uniformly in this box. You will see that if things are thrown randomly, there aren't too many very big gaps. On the left-hand side, you'll see very big gaps coming purely from the fact that the points cluster together. And if you measure the nearest neighbor distance from a point that's deep in this gap, you will find a very large value. Now you can convince yourself that that would mean that the CDF reaches one at a larger value. Okay. Because there are still some distances left which need to go into your CDF before it hits one. So that gives you some physical intuition of what's happening. The CDFs are actually very good at figuring out where the holes in your data are. Okay. And then because the clustering is determined by the cosmological parameters, so equation of state of dark energy, Hubble, et cetera, et cetera, that gets imprinted in the holes in your data. And the nearest neighbor distribution is actually a good way of statistically summarizing those holes. Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay. So what we did was we, in uh, one of, in the first paper, we showed that you know, shown the same data, so the same sets of halo positions, you measure the two point correlation function on the same data. You measure these nearest neighbor distributions. And you try to see how constraining those two summary statistics are on various cosmological parameters. Um, so the lighter color curve shows the Fisher error bars for the two-point correlation. The darker uh, uh, curves show what happens when you use the nearest neighbor analysis. 
And I don't want to get into the details of this, but basically you want narrower error bars. So whenever you use the nearest neighbor distributions, you get much narrower error bars on the parameters of interest, okay? Um, now, apart from measuring the autocorrelation of a set of points in cosmology, you are often interested in cross correlations between two data sets. So just as an example, let's say you have gravitational wave sources and you have regular galaxies. And you want to know if the gravitational wave sources correlate better with a set of blue galaxies that you have in your sample or a set of red galaxies that you have in your sample. You would measure the correlation, the cross correlation function between those data sets, okay? Now, using the nearest neighbor uh, measurements, you can also find cross correlations. Again, I'll briefly describe how you do that. So once again, you have these query points on your volume. I hope you can see them again. Now, instead of one set of data points, you have two sets of data points, one blue and one green. Now, again, you go to every query point, you ask what is the distance to the nearest green point and what's the distance to the nearest blue point. Okay. Once you've computed those distance, distances, just take the larger of them. Okay, I will not tell you why, but just take the larger of them. Okay, so I chose this one. Again, you go to a different query point, find the nearest blue and the nearest green and choose the larger of the two distances. Sort them get your CDF, and this, I'll claim, is a measure of the cross-correlation. Why is it a measure of cross-correlation? Again, for this, you will have to write down the generating function for these joint probabilities. So this is the probability of finding greater than K1 particles from set one and K2 particles from set two. If you write down the, the, the generating function for this probability distribution, you can show that this depends on all possible endpoint correlation, cross correlation functions. Okay, so how is how are the red galaxies correlated with themselves? How are the red galaxies correlated with the gravitational wave sources? How are the gravitational wave sources correlated with themselves? All of those information appear in this joint CDM. Uh, it's also quite easy to isolate the parts of these measurements which depend only on the cross correlation. So I'm interested only in the cross correlation of the gravitational waves with say red galaxies. <clears throat> uh, you can show that for completely uncorrelated data sets, the joint probability factorizes into the individual probabilities on each data set. Uh, this also holds for the CDFs. So you just subtract the cumulative distribution functions of the two separate uh, 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 sets of things that you're interested in. So the joint CDF minus the product of the individual CDFs is a measure of the cross correlation. Um, so in the interest of time, this is the last thing I'll talk about. So you can try to apply this formalism to a case where you have very few samples, and this will happen for gravitational wave sources, uh, very high energy neutrino sources at ice cube and so on. You will have very sparse data sets, and you want to measure the cross correlations between two sparse data sets. <laughs> So on the left, um, I took two sets of thousand uh, data points. In the case when they appear, when they are actually correlated, uh, the measurement of the two point cross correlation is this dark dashed line. I also took two sets of thousand points, which are not correlated. I measured the two point cross correlation and these are these lighter colored curves. So I took thousand different realizations of the same thing and I measured the two point cross correlation. Because there are so few objects, the measurement noise is enough to bring the measurement in the case where there is a co cross correlation at the same level as the case where there are no cross correlation. Takeaway point is if you use the two point cross correlation with just a thousand samples, uh, you can ask me about the number density. Meter. It is impossible to tell whether the two sets of points are cross correlated or not. Okay? The noise is so high. On the same set of objects, I measured the nearest neighbor cross correlations. In this case, you can see that the case in which it was truly cross correlated stands out starkly from the cases where they weren't cross-correlated. 
So the measurement noise is much lower in this case. Uh, this is a different way of presenting the same information is that if you, if you look at the chi-square distributions, so in the case where the two sets of thousand points are not cross-correlated, it doesn't matter if you measure the two-point cross-correlation function or the nearest neighbor distribution. They give you the normal chi-square distribution, okay? Your null hypothesis, chi-square distribution. But if you measure the two-point cross-correlation in the case where it was truly cross-correlated, you get a chi-square value that is well within your null hypothesis. Okay. So you'd say, okay, no cross-correlation. But for the same set of points, if you measure the cross-correlation using the nearest neighbor method, you see that the chi-square value is somewhere here. So you know, maybe a few sigma detection. So same data set, your significance of detection would be much higher here. Um, so I think I'm coming up on time. So the last thing I'll mention is that we've applied this. We actually did the first application of this method to data. We looked <clears throat> at the clustering of the thousand richest SDSS uh, clusters. Uh, we pulled out a signal, which was again, much, much stronger than the signal that can be pulled out via the two point correlation function. So you can see that the two-point correlation function chi-square is here. The null hypothesis chi-square distribution is here. Uh, and for the KNNs, the chi-square value is here. So many sigma detection. Uh, we also showed that the excess signal to noise that we are getting comes from our sensitiv sensitivity to the non-Gaussian part of the distribution. Uh, we did some tests to show that. But at the end, we showed that, you know, if you're interested in uh, measuring clustering of very sparse objects, KNNs are a much better way of going about it than the two-point correlation functions. Okay, so I will skip over this in the interest of time <clears throat> and let me summarize my talk. Um, so right at the beginning, I said that understanding structure formation in the universe, so how the small perturbations from the CMB grew to become galaxies, uh, halos, filaments, and voids can help answer some of the most fundamental questions in physics. You can talk about inflation, dark matter, dark energy, massive neutrino, additional light species, and this list continues. You can add your own favorite candidate. There's a large amount of untapped information on small nonlinear scales, even though the large linear scales we have mostly exploited. First of all, numerical simulations are crucial to make quantitative predictions for structure formation on these scales, okay? You can often get a qualitative picture of what should happen given a model, but to make quantitative predictions, you need numerical simulations, uh, much progress in the last decade or so. And the second thing to really make use of uh, information on small scales is to go beyond two-point statistics. Um, I've, I've spoken about the nearest neighbor distributions, uh, but other people are working on other aspects of this. So there's a community-wide push in this direction. And of course, the, the, what we'll get out of this is greater statistical constraining power given the same uh, survey. Um, and so with the wealth of data coming in the next two decades, I showed you a list of all the cosmology experiments that are planned for the next two decades. Uh, better simulations, statistical techniques, we expect many ex exciting advances. And with that, I'll stop and I will take your questions. So well, that's a fantastic talk. And uh, I should say that uh, at least maybe 75% of your talk is from a so that's a good review for the cosmology final exam. I hope you were not bored. I did not bore you going over the same thing. There are questions. So first we order look and then one through. So, right. so, you talked about uh, the uh, ultra light dark matter candidates. So, when you talked about uh, some uh, Schrodinger like Poisson situation, right. so we cannot use the black box without you know, Poisson. So, what are the big values or what are the physics you are using to? Uh, ah, so, you see that uh, instead of this equation here, the Poisson equation remains the same you write down a Schrodinger equation, okay? Just the normal Schrodinger equation, except that the potential is now set by the potential that you get here. 
right? So now it becomes nonlinear because the Poisson equation couples the density field back to itself. So the evolution of psi now depends on rho, which is psi psi bar. So it becomes a nonlinear equation. Uh, but it's just a Schrodinger equation with a nonlinear potential term. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. So I actually have two questions. The first is actually related to the dark matter of the model. So you talked about fuzzy dark matter. Now we know that like in HDM that there is like a top-down structure formation in CDNA, there's bottom up. So what is the case for like the NPM? So if that's, that's, that's a very good question. Um, one of the first things that you have to write down before writing down these fuzzy dark matter models is the fact that they're non, not thermally produced. So you're right, if, they were, if such light particles were thermally produced, they would act like hot dark matter and erase all the structure. But typically for these uh, axion-like models, uh, the... Uh, the way they are produced is not through some thermal coupling, you know, the inflaton then decays and give you know, couples thermally to these, but rather through something called the misalignment mechanism, uh, which is not a thermal origin at all. So there the advantage is you can keep making the particles as light as you want without running into these issues of whether you're wiping out the structure or not. But if you make them too light, what happens is the de Broglie wavelength becomes very large. Okay. Uh, and again, you run into issues of wiping out too much structure, but that starts happening when you are at masses of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23 electron volts. But for warm, uh, hot dark matter, you would start wiping out structure at even say a few electron volts. So I have another question. So you when you talked about the KRS neighborhood, so you showed plots of the CDMA like a particle or whatever. So, those, you know, slots like okay. one more. Yeah. Yeah, there's a like. So, you see that, you know, like in a very small community, small three particles, they also converge in a large show and they are separate only in each. So, what does this physically mean? Right. Uh, this. That's a very good question again. So the, the distances that you measure between the points will depend very uh, sensitively to the number density of the points that you originally chose. This plot was made for a particular number density. So you see that, you know, if your number density is very high, then even if you have gaps in your data, they cannot be larger than a certain number. Beyond that number, all these will converge to one. Again, on small scales, what happens is that whether you find a particle or not at such short distances from a query point is set purely by the Poisson chance, e to the power minus n bar v. And so again, all the three curves converge. The information, as you rightly said, resides here. Now it turns out that for typical the typical number density of many of the SDSS target galaxy samples and the DESI galaxy samples that will be coming uh, is around uh, you know, 10 to the minus 4 per megaparsec uh, cube. Right? There, the interparticle separation is roughly exactly around this region. It turns out that this is also the region which can be modeled uh, uh, most robustly by n body simulation. Yeah. It's not too small, but it's not large enough that everything is Gaussian. So it turns out we live somewhere in a happy place somewhere in between. Okay, thanks. Sir. So thank you for the next chapter. Things when you talk about the party data, it's interference uh, frequency. So we know the dark matter, we talk about dark matter, it's that they only react to the damage. So when you talk about interference, how do you infer that interact or how do you infer that? Uh, so this is purely an outcome of the fact that you have uh, your occupation number is so high that it no longer makes sense to talk about individual particles, but a field. 
the moment you write down a field, okay, you will typically get interference terms. Okay, how, how important they are will again depend on the mass. For very high mass particles, these interference fringes are not very important because the wave-like nature is not as important. But again, if you go down to very light masses, 10 to the minus 22, minus 23, these become important because the wave-like aspect of you know, that model becomes important. Uh, does that answer your question? I was, I was, okay. Thank you. Sir, it is a very nice talk. Uh, actually, my question is related to the interference pattern of the FTM. So, the interference pattern, this is the over density and the under density regions around the galaxies. Uh, what is the pattern actually? Is it the Hi. So, you will typically see these in regions of high density. Uh, these only happen once your. Uh, uh, once the density, typically these happen once the density crosses a certain threshold. So these are not uh, the typical over dense and under dense regions that we talk about. These are not in the voids. <clears throat> so let me just come here. This is actually uh, an object for me. So this will end up being a galaxy. These fingers you would typically see at the edges of these structures. Okay, the void is going to extend, you know, void is extending somewhere in the These interference fringes will typically see, you know, at the edges of clusters, uh, but not this is the key. The, the small fluctuations that you see between this point and this point, they will be typically separated by kiloparsecs. Whereas the size of the void is like tens of megaparsecs. Okay, so that's slightly different. Okay, so huh? this is typically on scales. So that's why uh, fuzzy dark matter is very well constrained by Langan alpha yeah. for yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, these are this like, yes, that's the question. Uh, so, that's what I was uh, saying. It's uh, these are transient. Okay, so where you see an interference pattern in, in at redshift one may not be the same place where you see the interference pattern at redshift 1.1 1 .1 because these are time varying. So it is a density It is a density fluctuation, but it's it's a transient density fluctuation. So whether these will actually accrete matter or not is not clear. Okay. Uh, but it, it will it will give you a time varying potential. And then you can try to think of interesting phenomena. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like, is there an observation like, it's like, uh, like we are, need, yeah? So we are we need to work out what the observational uh, or what the smoking gun signal of this will be, and then go look for that in data. Like gravitation, we know the, the this will be uh, you know the strength of the gravitational waves produced by this will be very very low. So unless you are thinking of some global signal like background, I don't think this will be measurable. But yes. I don't know. You can look into it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, what do you have? Oh, I have a comment. So we need to follow up with the question. So uh, I understand the output of the phase shift because of the rate of time. Could difference? So what quantity does the phase shift actually depend on? Exactly. Uh, what do you mean by the phase shift? I, didn't uh, I mean, uh, producing difference, you need to have a phase shift caused by some effective sleep in your uh, simulation, right? Ah, so all that is happening here is that, you know, um, uh, because of the gravitational potential, right? Diff so think of, the, think of the initial distribution as having every point in your space having some initial amplitude and phase. Okay, now because of the gravitational potential, these things come close to each other. Initially, it was all a coherent field, but now because of gravitational potentials, different parts that end up at the same point have different phases. 
Okay. So different that, parts of your initial field. Yeah. So the by measuring field difference changes, you should have an idea of the gravitational field you're dealing with. Uh, the, the the gravity the the interference fringes depend on the wavelength and the gravitational potential. Any other questions? Okay, then one from Hashan one. Yes. Nice doctor. Um, one slide is saying that the swallowing scale in and in rowing. What is this? Right. Yes. Uh, yes. So this is uh, so. Suppose you started. You met, you had one thousand particles, and you could finish this calculation in ten seconds. Question is, if I now try to repeat the same calculations for two thousand particles, how long will it take theoretically? Okay. If it scales as n cubed, then what took me ten seconds? Uh, sorry, n squared. n squared. Now will take me 40 seconds. Right. But if I have n log n, this is actually log 2 technical point. Then the scaling, then it will be 20 seconds plus a little bit. Because log n is a very slow function. Mm -hmm. As you go to more and more particles, this becomes very important. Okay. So now it says, unless there are some younger. Okay. So, I have uh, two questions. One is that uh, when you are constraining the dark energy, mm -hmm. and you are saying that uh, you are doing the scale of this time 20 megahertz per second, how do you do that? The dark energy is in your background. Also. Absolutely. That we think more than 40 megahertz. That's right. That's a very good question. So what happens is that the evolution of the perturbations depend on your background evolution. So for example, if you did not have dark energy at all, then you will have much more clustering. Sigma 8 would be much higher. So it is, in a sense, you're not directly constraining W by measuring what's happening on very small scales. But because W is degenerate with many other things that depend on clustering, if I can constrain those better, then the degeneracy becomes much narrower. So it's indirect in that sense. And uh, the question is about the two in the middle of it. Then it says that it's a uh, right now it's 0.1 meter away. Yeah. Would you have that such a small middle of mass guy? Scale or the halo mass scale that is going to be uh, affected by the halo is. Yes. Uh, by uh, correctly, we are not able to scale or take the Directly being suppressed, yes. Sir. Directly being suppressed, yeah. and even not even more than 0.11, I'm not sure how much. Why one? And this is the scale where the darkness will be. So what happens for neutrino, there are two effects coming from neutrino. Again, one is the direct effect. The other one is uh, how does it back react on the CDN? Okay, the change in the transfer function. No, no, no. Uh, the evolution of the CDM transfer function, how that changes in the presence of neutrinos. That is where that famous 8F new damping comes in. So if you have, yeah, so if you have uh, neutrinos, some being 0.1, 8F new actually turns out to be 8%. So sigma 8 will change by 8% if you have 